questions. Let's just apply them in, with questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, Courtney Everett Mikatin is, and I think you see her name there, uh, is a friend. And Mindy Wilson will soon be a BFF as well. They're both members of Integrated Schools. Integrated Schools is made up of white and or privileged parents who care a lot about sending their kids to school outside of the bubble, or the bubble they might otherwise be in, perhaps, and who believe that their kids are strong and that growing up with children from all backgrounds is what makes great people. Of course, we're going to spend a bunch of time better understanding their work and why they do it and all of that, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, Courtney is a mom of two and founded Integrated Schools in 2014 after more than a decade of working on integration in her Los Angeles neighborhood. And you can see her sitting outside showing off her beautiful weather while it's dark outside mm -hmm. here in Western Massachusetts. Mindy uh, Wilson is also a mom of two. She lives in Houston, Texas, supports public edu education and integration through advocacy within her local school district. Mm -hmm. So really glad to have you both here. Thank you. Um, and let's just start with this very basic question of what is Integrated Schools? Uh, you know, why did you start it, Courtney? Who's in it? Um, what are you trying to do? Right? I'm constantly wondering that question. <laughs> um, so a very not um, uncommon story. I live in a diverse neighborhood now, very intensely gentrifying. And when my kids were little, it became really clear that none of the white and or professional privileged families who were moving into this neighborhood were sending their kids um, to the local schools. And not only were they not sending their kids, they weren't even thinking about sending their kids to the local school, not even touring. Um, so long story short, we ended up lobbying the district for a dual language program, which sounded really amazing at the time. Um, we live in a largely um, Latinx neighborhood. And so we thought having that Spanish English dual language situation would be great because it would prevent the school from completely gentrifying and also would ideally provide some equity at the classroom level, right? Because my kids are gonna come in without speaking any Spanish. So it sounded really great on paper and in a lot of ways is great. But um, what we really realized along the way was if we're not talking about integration, we're not talking about integration. So while it works in some ways as a mechanism for integration, it can very quickly turn into opportunity hoarding. It can turn into gentrification of a school, um, but we're not talking about integration. So um, Integrated Schools was founded really to build out um, parent support for school integration as a, as a priority, right? And the people who are undermining school integration are white and or privileged families. So our work is really to change the way we talk about integration um, with white families and to, in, in order to make it a priority, right? But also um, to ensure that the white families who are showing up to these global majority schools show up in a way that makes, um, that builds equity right, that we don't just turn into colonizers. And there's a thousand things that happen along the way. You can come in as like a fix your neighborhood school, kind of well-meaning, I wanna support my local school sort of thing that turns quickly into white saviorism. Or, you know, there's all these different ways that white families show up, even when they're well-intentioned, that do a lot of damage on the school, at, you know, at the classroom and campus level. So the other part of what we do is ensuring that the families have resources to do that with equity in mind. So we're definitely going to get into that uh, question, yeah. Courtney. Um, let me just ask Mindy the same. So how did you get involved in integrated schools? Your short bio says that you were already doing this work, right? And we know that you are doing this. So can you say something about how you got involved in this? And also what, what does, you know, you're in Houston, Courtney's in LA. So how does that work? Yeah. So, um, I found my way into integration um, first through for, through educational advocacy. Um, when my, my oldest child started to go to school and he was pre-K three, um, we, we did what all of the other, you know, all of our white friends, affluent friends did. We uh, played this, 
this uh, kind of lottery. It's the, we have a magnet program here in Houston where you submit your application and uh, you try to get into the, you know, the school of your choice. Um, so we did win the lottery. We got into this school, this, this Montessori school. It's a public school. It's not a charter. It, it is just a regular um, public school. And so we got into that school and uh, we were there for a little bit. We started going to board meetings and we started to kind of look around and realize the small complaints that we had or the things we were really frustrated with um, at our, at our, um, sorry, that's my phone ringing. I didn't see this. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's exactly what happens on our end all the time. I apologize. I apologize. Um, anyway, so sorry. Yeah, that was so real. Distracting. I really thought I could work past it, but I guess. Um, so we got into the school. It was um, a, a majority, uh, or the it was more dominantly white than the district was. And we started going to school board meetings and learning what the district actually looked like. Uh, I started to learn so much more about the schools outside of the gates of my school, across town from my school. And it became apparent to me that I needed, as I was advocating at board meetings and, and giving speeches and paying attention to policy and trying to move the board to be more equitable, I needed to look inside of myself and walk that walk. Um, I realized that the school I was in was getting more resources because of the program it had, and it had a larger amount of affluent parents. And so I decided to make a very intentional step to um, enroll my child in a school across town, um, not directly in my neighborhood. And so a school that looked um, more like the city, a school that looked more like the, the beautiful cultures around us. Um, and so my oldest child um, started last year in a school. And so um, it's, uh, I think it's about 1% white, maybe just under 1% white, uh, largely uh, Latinx and black and about 96% um, about at or below poverty level. This is amazing, beautiful little school. Um, you know, really just an average school, it's great. I mean, it's really wonderful, but seeing the juxtaposition between that school and, um, and where we were, just seeing the haves and the have-nots of the district have allowed me to get more involved and really open my eyes to what segregation looks like in my city and how I can learn more and how I can be of service and, uh, you know, kind of, play a, a part in desegregation, even if it's a tiny drop, a pebble in the, in the you know, the entire lake. So that's kind of, um, if you're a friend, I, uh, a friend said, hey, did you see this integrated schools online? I talked to this woman, Courtney, she's amazing. I got a hold of Courtney and yeah, I mean, she walked us, I mean, she's amazing. And I'm just gonna just talk to Courtney's home for a second, but no, but like, you know, so you're hearing as a white person that you should always want to get as much for your child as you possibly can, especially education. You should go for the school that has the most resources. You should go for the school that has the biggest PTA and has all of the, you know, the bells and whistles. And that's what you should do. That's what good parents do, right? Um, but that narrative is really faulted and for lots of different reasons. And so to leave, um, you know, to, to really look a, a, away from that and be honest about what was going on. Uh, Courtney was really instrumental and helpful for me as she I know she has been for many other families really being honest about where they are and what they and the intention they want to have and the education they truly want their child to be getting and uh, you know what mark they want to make in desegregating school. Okay um, so uh, I, I want to sort of add that um, I think families of color are also taught to do as much as they can you know for their kids but you know, whether it's sometimes it's not in reach or sometimes uh, there's also this narrative of, um, you know, it's about academic excellence and this disregard for, you know, the social emotional piece that is really, you know, that Beverly Tatum and loads of people have talked about, you can't really have the rigor, you know, the academic rigor without having a, uh, an environment that actually um, is culturally welcoming, right, for all kids. And so, that, by the way, I mean, this is something that we need to, we'll get into, but certainly reading just even that short bit of the bio, or bit of the um, description of integrated schools and what you believe in, and certainly, I mean, Courtney and I are friends and have had these conversations uh, many times. I mean, I know that, you know, it's not that you don't think you're doing right by your kid. You think you're doing right by your kid and your understanding of that is different 
of what that entails is different mm -hmm. than right. right is usually right. what we usually understand people right. of all stripes right so mm -hmm. we tend to go for the high test scores you know as if yeah. that's mm -hmm. all that matters kind of thing but yeah sorry go ahead. Oh. yeah the neighborhood i grew up in the school is rated a one right now on great schools you know so this is sort of um anyway the, um, the test scores have determined a lot of this right so you were saying mindy and sort of asking you both this that you do your part you know the pebble and you know that has a ripple effect in the lake um what about other pebbles like is there is this a move is this a movement to integrate schools and maybe in particular among white families you know and how if so what does it look like what more do we need how can we help the momentum there I mean, for me, I can I can speak for um, just my little piece of the pie, though I think this is probably a better question for Courtney, because I know she's more involved kind of across the United States and talks to people all over. Um, so I would say that um, it's not, there are definitely families, so I'm not the only family at my school who's done it. There's myself and another family um, who have, you know, intentionally integrated. Um, and I think that I, I hear more about it and people are asking a lot of questions. I have gone to meetings just around town, friends of ours, um, kind of all over. Oh, sorry, I don't know if that's me. I can hear the feedback. Um, so, uh, you know, different people that I've met and know are, you know, considering it, questioning the narrative and, and making a different decision. So, I mean, how, how big that is, um, I think Courtney could probably speak to that more, but there's definitely people really paying attention and thinking more. I think there's a lot of great um, authors out there that have kind of led the way and really helped people start to take a step back and learn a lot more about what's going around and being intentional about their decision making. Mm -hmm. Right. So Courtney, did you want to speak yeah. to that? Yeah. Do you want to mention Nicole Hannah-Jones, right? Others? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's... A there are a lot of people who've done, you know, work on this issue, but um, Nicole Hannah-Jones is probably the most well-known. I think um, I sort of have two answers to this. Uh, one is, you know, yes, there's a lot more talk of this. And I, I the, the conversations that I'm having now are really different than the conversations I was having a decade ago when my kids were little, right? And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the current administration. And I think a lot of that has to do with kind of a post Ferguson wake up in a, in a sense, right? Like just to speak very generally, like white families are kind of questioning, you know, their complicity and, you know, race problems. And, you know, I think it's still a long, we have a long way to go before we can kind of have, have a full deep movement to to em, embrace all of this school integration stuff very fully. But I also think that, you know, we're about to celebrate the 64th anniversary of Brown v. Board. And we've had, you know, many years of policy trying to, you know, uh, regulate and legislate integration. And, you know, it, it's failed. So until you're actually building out a, a, a desire for that, Right, I, I think that it's going to be really hard to to be able to do anything meaningful. Right, we've seen you know attempts, whether you argue that they're great attempts or half-hearted attempts, but with every attempt, white families can kind of get out of it. Right, we'll do magnet schools, we'll move, we'll charter schools, whatever the story is. You know, I think that that capitalizing on this moment and then also you know we're talking about parenting slightly differently we're talking about or you know we're living in more diverse communities and yes that means gentrification but what does it mean in relation to school so i think there's a lot of things that are coming together at this point in time that makes it a perfect time to have this discussion and i think building out the parent piece is is the part that's been missing in our national you know push towards integration if you could call it so, I mean, I'd love to, you know, get into your family's, right, respective experiences uh, with this, right? So, Mindy already mentioned that your two young kids um, are the, among the 1% of white kids uh, in, your, in the school they go to. You know, Courtney, I know you have a similar situation. Do you want to just say a, a quick word about, you know, so how old are your kids and how, what does their school look like and how long have they been going there? 
yeah, my boy is now in uh, ninth grade, and I think he's the only white kid, although I've heard rumors of other white kids, and the school is over 90% free reduced lunch. So, you know, there's, um, and he's kind of walked through very similar circumstances since kindergarten, and the girl is in seventh grade, and she, there's a few more white kids in her class, but it's still largely um, Latinx and largely immigrant Spanish-speaking families and free British lunch. So the boy and the girl. <laughs> that's so Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, 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 they have like a social media identity now, and they're like, you can't say that. Yeah, no, that's very fair. So, um, so your kids are obviously older, and uh, one thing, you know, at, at the risk of sounding like a ridiculous softball question, I really am interested to know, yeah, you, you know, LA has more than a few percent white people. Houston has more than a few percent white people. Um, you obviously among a very small minority of white parents who are could choose otherwise, but are choosing to send your kids to um, schools where your kids are very, your white children are very much in the minority. Just what do we need to know to understand why you would do this? <laughs> I mean, obviously you believe in what you're doing, but how does that come to happen? I know it's a hard question. I just wonder if there's anything you can say that would under let us understand why you're so strange. Or is it, why is it not happening more frequently? Well, that's... Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I can speak to why I'm strange. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it, it, it started, at least for me, it, it's a... It's a, it's a much deeper decision. It's not a surficial decision. Um, it's doing, uh, trying to create something a little bit better and a better place um, and doing better for my children than maybe the opportunities I had. And this is one of the opportunities I did not have. Um, you're right. Um, there are, in HISD, which is the school district, the largest school district in Texas, the uh, Houston School District, it is 8% um, uh, white, surprisingly. The city has quite a few more white children, um, white families, but 8% are white. Um, of those, um, a lar largely um, the white families kind of, there's a handful of schools that are more dominantly white, uh, definitely more than the, um, the percentage of the district. So those particular schools uh, tend to also have the lowest amount of, you know, I guess they would have, the, they have the highest amount typically of affluent children. Um, most of our schools, because our district average is 80% of the kids are at or below poverty level or, or you know, qualify for free and reduced lunch, you would think that all of our schools then in our district would be Title I. Uh, there's actually a, a good handful of schools that are not Title I, which means they have less than like 32% of their students uh, require, um, qualify for free and reduced lunch. So you can see this kind of these, you know, these pods of affluence. And really the school we were at prior um, was closer to that. I think they were still technically title one, but I think the narrative is you, you hang out with people, they say, these are the good schools. These ones over here are good and we're trying really hard to get into those good ones. And these ones over here, the narrative is they must not be good. Um, this is over here is my zone school, but I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. We're trying everything. Either we get in here or we go to private school. Either we get here or we consider homeschool. So that's kind of the narrative. And so um, when I first stepped in and my oldest was three, I was like, okay, you know, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. I came from a small town in, in Wisconsin, actually. I think I saw someone up there said Madison and I was like, oh, not too far away from there. Um, and I didn't really have an opportunity to, um, the culture was this very homogenous. Um, and, and so I, you know, put my child in school thinking that he would have this really beautiful, diverse situation. And I really started to have to be honest about the fact that it really wasn't that diverse. It was actually quite segregated uh, compared to what I thought it should be. So, I mean, I think for me, um, it, it became a small, step in that direction. So now my youngest child is not yet in that school. I'm hoping he gets in next year because he would be pre-K four. So we're trying to get over there. It, require, it does require for us a principal transfer. So we can, um, he, and that school is under enrolled. So if a school's under enrolled, it's a lot easier to get in there. So the school we came from had a waiting list of, I don't know, the year we applied, it was like 600 people on the waiting list. 
So that's what a good school looks like, right? All the people think that's great. And then um, then you have all of these wonderful, great, beautiful, you know, neighborhood schools um, that are, you know, have open spots. And so that's kind of what we are doing. Um, we are, um, you know, intentionally changing some of that dialogue and having great conversations with people about the schools that they didn't even give a chance to, they didn't even walk through, they didn't even consider, um, and to have those deep conversations. Um, uh, did you want to say something, Courtney? Just really quickly. So, it, you know, people come to, at least to integrated schools, right, as an organization, but people are showing up in integrating spaces for a lot of different reasons, right? So Mindy kind of came to it, kind of seeing inequity and feeling, you know, a sense of wanting to at least not contribute, if not, um, not being able to solve it, but certainly not contributing to it. Um, and I, you know, then there's people like me who just sort of, I lived in this neighborhood and when we moved in here, it felt like we should be a part of this community. Um, and, and I sort of learned what actually that meant along the way. But I, I think that there's this, this piece of it that Mindy and I have talked a lot about, right? That you just kind of believe that your kid is gonna be fine, right? There's, there's this cushion of privilege that you know, whiteness and middle classness or whatever provides and, and just trusting that my kids aren't actually that incredibly fragile, right? That they'll be able to do this. And, um, and I think that's a, that's a motivating piece for a lot of, for a lot of families who are doing this mm -hmm. too. Um, so I wonder, uh, Julie, uh, Julie has a great question here that's sort of related to something we wanted to ask about. Um, well, what is, she's asking in your, what's your narrative now? You know, what makes a good school versus what, you know, the uh, good test scores and, um, you know, perhaps lots of resources and clubs and AP, more AP classes than the, the school across the tracks or whatever it is. Um, and related to that, uh, what do you mean by integration? That's a huge question. That was not fair. Yeah, <laughs> I'll try to answer it really fast. Sorry, Mindy, did you wanna? No, you go first, you go first. Um, what makes a great school or what makes a school good is that it has kids in it. You know, I think it's, in some ways that's really simple, right? And what matters to me most is that it reflects the city that we live in, right? It reflects like the broader community, not necessarily just the neighborhood, but the city we live in and that, that, that that piece matters and that I'm not taking more than my fair share in a sense. And it's really hard to know what that means. But, you know, when you're at a school that has PTA raising $400,000 versus $4,000, um, you know, it is kind of easy to look at. But that might be the slightly pithy answer. So maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I have to, I have to say, what makes a good school is it's a school with teachers who love those children. It's a school with people who want the best for their children. It's a school where children are having fun and playing and learning from each other. I mean, that's a, that's a good school. Um, I think that when we start to get, or at least when um, I hear parents getting kind of uh, looking at different, um, you know, websites online to tell them if it's a good school, if they're looking at test scores to decide if it's a good school, um, if they're looking at uh, any number of data, right? I mean, people just love, they love numbers. So if that's the thing that's going to push you, I would, I would, you know, I, I think you're sometimes missing what makes um, some schools really just absolutely amazing. And, uh, and then also it comes, you have to decide what, what do you really want for your child? I know my child's going to be just fine. Uh, my child will come home to me and my husband and uh, everything, you know, and, he is, I can tell you that I've seen a difference in my child. And so I know my decision is good first before he walks in the door. But now that he's been there, um, I wouldn't change that decision for the world. And I would encourage any parent to uh, consider it if, that, if it's at all, you know, on their minds and something they're interested in. So let me, let me push you both, right? So one way of um, that some people certainly could read, uh, could hear what you've both just said is, your two privileged white moms 
with privileged white kids. And it doesn't matter actually what school you go to. And as long as you, your kids stay physically safe, you're going to be fine because it's already predetermined because, right, you have, um, Courtney, you use the term opportunity, opportunity hoarding in your opening remarks. So for folks who don't know, right, this idea that uh, privileged groups often use in the racial context, so privileged white people, you know, in a sense, hoard the opportunity among themselves, right, and other people who look like them. So that that's, for example, what, you know, elite private schools might do, right, we're going to just take all that privilege and the social capital and so on in those schools and we're going to keep it into within our group. Um, well, you know, if you um, benefit, right, if you are in a privileged group that benefits from that privilege, so your kids will be fine no matter what, that's one thing, then you can afford to make that choice. But if you're not in such a group, if you are perhaps a poor white family, right, if you are um, yeah, poor of any kind or, you know, otherwise feel disadvantaged in some way, well, then education actually is more key to upward mobility and you can't afford, right? So, and then of course there is, um, you know, and you, you've heard all of these arguments and, and counterpoints, but certainly they're worth mentioning. I won't mention them all, but there also will be people of color, right? Parents of children of color who say, wait a second, right? Are these two, you know, well-meaning white liberal women really saying that, um, my kids, my child of color, will benefit from being next to their child of color, right? So this is sort of this noblesse oblige. Well, not their child of, of power. Right, next to their white child, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, say, well, that's problematic, right? Is it really the case that, you know, why can't we have, quote unquote, segregated, you know, predominantly uh, people of color schools that also serve our kids? Anyway, there are obviously more objections that you, again, will be familiar with, but what do you say to those folks? Um, I mean, I think the answers are really depending on, you know, what the conversation is about. But, you know, for families of color, it's real, right? You're going to show up with your, you know, black daughter, and the reality is she is more likely to be disciplined at higher rates than my white daughter, right? She is less likely to be tested for gifted than my white daughter. Like all of that stuff is really real. And yet we've done desegregation on the backs of black and brown kids entirely, right? I mean, for not entirely, for the most part. So, you know, when we're doing, when we're trying to work toward equity, it, it, you know, if that's the goal of desegregation, I think that it really doesn't, it, it shouldn't be on the backs of people who, you know, have these things stacked against them because of the structural racism that we're facing down. So, you know, that isn't, I don't think, the work of families who feel like they're not going to be treated equally or equitably, right? And, you know, that could go with, uh, that could be the same storyline for people who, you know, are kids who are growing up in poverty, kids who are neuroatypical, right, who are facing down different challenges. But they're, you know, there are a lot of middle-class white kids who are going to school and that's the place to start this work. And those are the kids who aren't going to integrating spaces. Mindy, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I always feel that, uh, especially public school, is a reflection of what we want our society to be. And, um, we can choose as parents to keep our children in what would be considered more um, segregated if we looked honestly at some of the schools, maybe we would gravitate towards based on how our friends or people we know might label them. But at the end of the day, our children are citizens. Uh, our children are going to go out in the world and they're gonna work with people and they're going to interact with people and they're gonna have meaningful relationships with people and they're gonna make decisions. And I think that uh, my job as a mother I have lots of jobs, but one of them is to make just a really uh, a thoughtful um, uh, citizen, two of them, um, that are going to go into the world and try and um, learn from people. And, and I want to create a situation where um, my children are going to be white men someday, um, right? So they're, um, they are already in a position, uh, looking at our culture, they're already in a position of privilege. Um, 
And so because of that, I, I want to do my best to make sure that they are, uh, they kind of look at the world around them and people around them and really understand uh, and ask, um, you know, look, look at, for them to be in a situation, for them to be a minority for a second in their life, there's, they're not gonna be harmed by that and they, only good things can happen. And so I, I it was you know, kind of echoing some of the stuff that Courtney, Courtney said here that um, we, uh, and I say we as just you know, white families and, and our white family, and it's just part of the group here, um, we're set up to kind of take more resources. That's how the system's set up. And so I'm, I'm trying to intentionally as a, as a mother and a person um, trying to create um, a scenario, try to raise children that might be more mindful and thoughtful of the world around them. And I feel like that has to start at school because that's the only way we can, I can get them to a point where they can maybe be more thoughtful as they, you know, enter society. So, but did you say, you know, um, there's so, a sound. Yeah. Mm, okay, funny sound. I sounded like Darth Vader for a minute. Um, so we're going to move into, those are great answers, uh, lots of questions, you know, some of which we also had, so we'll, we'll, we'll take these. Um, so uh, Jess asks, as we integrate schools, how do we make sure we're not colonizing? You referred to that, Courtney. Uh, what are some strategies that you, you two have used for this? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's the next um, Embrace Race webinar, right? <laughs> like it's, it's a many hours conversation. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there's a couple of, ma uh, of main points. And, and one is to not approach this school with a sense of risk, right? Just to like walk in there knowing that it'll be okay. Because I think that when we show up with this risk mindset, like, I don't know, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. Like, you, you know, you find the danger and the scary when you're looking for it. Um, and so, you know, keeping that risk stuff at bay is helpful. And, and the other is really thinking about your job on, you know, on campus is one of advocating for all kids. So when you're talking about your kids, that's a parent-teacher conversation. And in public spaces, you are talking about what's best for all kids. And probably you really should just be listening to what other people are talking about, right? So it's, you know, showing up with humility, understanding that, you know, whatever parent organization is there that might be very small, tiny, haphazard, whatever, that might not look like the privileged segregated, you know, PTAs or what, whatever, um, it might look different, but you have to sort of be in it for a while without trying to make deep changes, right? And again, there's a thousand ways to talk about this, but I think those would be the two big, big parts. And let me, um, maybe I'll come to you in just a second. Um, you know, I wanted to, so one thing we know that I know that um, integrated schools challenges white parents to do is to actually go and walk into, right, your neighborhood school. Uh, the school many white parents are not considering and and literally not stepping foot into before they make school choices for their kids. So I wonder if you could say a little something about that. Um, you know, I don't know if you're doing it. I assume this is a, a challenge wherever uh, integrated schools has a, has a footprint, right, and has members. But, you know, you tell us about that. Tell us what what you're hearing from parents uh, who do that. And if you can also, you know, want to pick up on this question uh, someone asked about, yeah, what are your experiences? Again, your kids are very different ages. You know, Courtney, your kids can, you know, have had a longer experience than their older kids. But yeah, what, you know, that's, <laughs> they're living the experience that a lot of parent, white parents think they don't want their kids to experience. So what, what are they finding? What are they saying? Um, so, uh, I think the challenge of walking through schools is really uh, such an important and really thoughtful um, challenge because I think that um, as I've had conversations with parents, first off, many of the parents will ask me, you know, when, when you're in the playground and where does your child go to school and I'll mention the school we go to and they'll say like, where, where is that? What's, what school is that? Is that even in this district? I mean, it's a school that they just, you know, haven't considered. Now, uh, our school is a little bit further away from our house than most of the people we know might, you know, the school they might walk into that might be their neighborhood school. 
But yeah, I think a lot of them, when you, they say they wouldn't go to that school because it's not a good school, I very rarely have found that they have walked through there, the school right down the street. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's really, really important. And it also puts eyes on, um, you see children enjoying themselves in a beautiful learning environment and you see all of these things um, and you're forced to see them when you walk through. Um, so my experience personally, um, so I took my child out of the school we were at, but I also, um, this, the school we were going to had um, uh, largely Spanish speaking classrooms and English speaking first grade classrooms. And I wanted to bring him, we don't speak Spanish at our house. Um, I wanted him to have that opportunity. So I took him and it's an 80, 20 day. So I literally, we were working on just a couple Spanish words at home during the summer. And I dropped him into a classroom where 80% of his day is in Spanish and 20% is in English. And um, uh, it went amazing, um, far but beyond, beyond my expectations. But I mean, I don't, whether my child speaks another language or not was just uh, an opportunity at that school. Um, but really what the most important thing is the relationships he immediately started to form and the smile on his face and um, him just, just kind of lighting, uh, just being very alive and, and light and happy and just really um, realizing like you, yeah, like kind of what Courtney said before, they aren't as fragile and as, you know, my child did great, is doing great, is so happy, couldn't imagine leaving his school. And so I think that's really important to, uh, you know, we drop them off and we cringe and we wait, right? Thinking the weight of this decision as a parent when a child is walking from one, in from one you know, school into another school and their view on this is much smaller. Um, and it's just been a really, really beautiful experience for us. Not to say that it's easy. I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat this and say, oh, you walk in and it's birds are chirping. And of course, every school and every situation, you're you're still going to be, you know, at a school and there's going, you're gonna see, I saw, you know, difference is in, you know, maybe the kids, you know, at one school, they are, you know, the school's really great at making sure that they have fruit as their only snack. And then the other school, they have most of their fundraisers might have be selling candy. I mean, these are some of the things that you see. You see the differences in uh, this PTA or PTO can fill in the blanks when a district is pulling out money from the, you know, there's budget cuts. And, but this school doesn't seem to be affected as much because they can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. This other school over here are very, very affected by any budget cuts that would happen from the district level. And these are important things that a lot of affluent parents, at least where I live, don't have eyes on it as closely. Like it's hard to have eyes on it unless you're living it. So I think that's another reason why it's really important. Okay. Um, Courtney, did you want to get in on your, add? since again, your kids are older and have yeah. been in it longer and have their own, can express themselves probably a little bit better. Yeah. They're at the age where they express themselves a lot. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Um, with like biting language. No, so, uh, they definitely see the differences between what some of their friends have at school and what they have. You know, Mindy's school sounds a little bit idyllic and my school was a bit of a mess, right? Like we had five principals in elementary school. It was like every progressive parent's like pedagogical nightmare, right? They had the behavior charts with the sad faces. They did worksheets every day. My best friend's kids were like, going to the Mir space station for field trips and my kids were learning how to sit still, like just a nightmare all the way through. And yet, right, like he, both of my kids still have interests in things and their curiosity hasn't been crushed and they are, I hate to say testing well because I don't believe in the test, but they're testing fine. Like all of this is still fine. Um, you know, I think that uh, middle school was really hard especially for my son. Um, the kids were like, you're the rich white boy. We can't talk, you know, we're not talking to you anymore. Like this was, that was some real big times. And he came home one day and was like, will you please send me to a white school? I'm like, ah, you're killing me. But, um, you know, we talked about it, right? There's also this issue of middle school land where everybody's trying to define each other by their difference and what you know what my kid wasn't hearing was how they were making fun of you know jeffrey for always having 
bagel and his braces or, you know, whatever, whatever other stuff was going on. He's only hearing what's happening to him. And when he goes to wealthy white school, two miles away, they're still going to make fun of him. It just probably won't be that his parents have watched and made him watch project runway. Apparently that's rich white TV. So, you know, like they're, but yet a year later, you know, they've kind of like he and his classmates have really worked through it and they're able to talk about that he's the white kid and and he crashed a quinceanera a couple weekends ago and you know like they're they've worked through a lot of things in ways that he wouldn't have had to if he had been elsewhere so let let me let me just push you a little bit on that courtney right so because what i heard there is um a series of reasons why your son hasn't been crushed right or and that last piece about middle school is well you know middle school students go through a lot of stuff and they would he would be going through stuff at a wider school and so you know let's not freak out about that particular thing it has a particular cast on it but you know it's really i haven't heard you say you know my son or my daughter um if they were part of this conversation they would say you know what, here's the plus in going to this school versus, you know, the alternative that most of, you know, my friend who visited the Mir space station goes to. Um, and again, you know, not, we're not putting words in his mouth, right? But we're distinguishing between what you see as uh, possible benefits to your kids and what they recognize. And again, especially yours, Courtney, as older kids, what they recognize if they do as beneficial to the experience for them. Yeah, that's super real, right? And and part of the part of the difficulty is it is that they just don't have any other experience to compare it with, really, right? So they have never really lived in a super white world, and they will, right? Because they're going to grow up and they're going to be in other spaces. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to hear what they say in six years, right? When they when they have a little bit of perspective and distance and but you know, we did give the the boy some voting power. He didn't he retained veto power, but you know, he he chose this and he for high school, right? He it wasn't even a question. We didn't have to pull out the parent social justice stuff or like talk anything to it. He was just clear. He's like, This is you know, this is where I wanna be. So I I feel like there's something in that, right? Um but trying to get a 15 year old or my 15 year old to talk to me about anything can be hard. So I don't totally know how to answer you deeply. Totally fair. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so we're getting a bunch of questions um, about, here's some, Megan is asking about um, what you do, your you're you're confident that your kids will be fine you uh you two um in particular in in their schools um, but how do you advocate for resources for the schools that they're in um yeah how do you work to change to change conditions that should be improved yeah i think um and then kind of coming back to what kind of impact do you make on a school so you aren't a colonizer um, I think that, uh, you know, the instinct um, at the old school would have been to just kind of march into that principal's office and demand these things or, you know, go ahead and um, ask for these things. Sometimes that, I mean, and, and not that, that um, there aren't situations that maybe you might need to do that, but they're probably far fewer than they, they really are. Um, I would say that first listening, first asking, first kind of hearing from the community, there are times when yeah, I mean, we're in the classroom and there's, you know, they want to have a, you know, a, you know, they want to do an Easter candy sale, right? Uh, I don't particularly want to do an Easter candy sale for different reasons, but it's not about me. Uh, where can I plug in if I can help? If this is something I can do, it can be a part of. Um, not coming in and saying, well, I will do the Easter candy sale, everybody. I mean, it's just finding out where to plug in. And, and that, that, I think, goes into... Uh, these simple things as fundraising, but also as an advocacy, you know, if um, there's a way to advocate, it's making sure to do that from the lens of the entire community and not just my child needs or this is upsetting to my child. Yes, having those conversations with the teacher if that's necessary, but still, I mean, I try to do those few and far between 
not that I have to nitpick. I notice different things, tiny things. Will my child be fine? He will totally be fine, right? Um, do I want, you know, candy as a reward when he gets his math question, right? No, not necessarily. But if that happens sometimes, you know, that happens. It happens. Um, I think that it's like taking back that need to try and fix and control and just kind of letting the reins go a little bit and realizing that that little horse will go in the right direction most of the time and things will be okay. Even if they, you get that initial reaction that you must get involved, they will likely be okay. And there are times though, I would say to every parent, I think the important thing, and, I, and this is just because I love advocating and education, there are times you need to help people advocate for your school if that's necessary on a district level. Um, if there are things happening and that district needs to know, and you are maybe the families within that area don't don't they aren't they don't know where to plug in or how to uh, advocate or you know kind of rallying people. If there's something that you all have a very common concern about, I think that if if that's a if that's a, a something that people are comfortable with, I think that's a really uh, excellent place to plug in if that's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, Sorry, Courtney. Um, you know, I hear from a lot of families that like once they've sort of been in this school and really become a part of the school community that, you know, it's just sort of common discussion in a lot of ways. Like, okay, the white lady needs to go talk to the principal, but we need to send, you know, like there's, there's, um, kind of like racial and privilege strategizing that all the parents do together once you've built trust in community so that you can advocate for what the community feels like is important, whether it's, you know, changing the behavior chart system or advocating at the district level or, you know, whatever it is. But once you're sort of in community, that's, that's the place to begin. You know, there's, um, we've had a, yeah, several questions about really how do you um, engage the folks who are not the choir and of course most of the world is not the choir and and some um, maybe a lot of the people the parents that you engage are not the choir right so so how do you do that again the challenge to you know go and actually walk in that neighborhood school um, and just see it for yourself before you make a decision is clearly part of that I uh, would uh, I think folks would love to hear about more about how you do that and really how you have the conversation uh, in a way that right people can hear. I did want to ask one thing uh, before that, though, which is, you know, for for us, uh, such a big part of what we do um, is trying to, you know, it really is trying to be very real about the challenge of doing this work, right? And part of what's really what's super real about uh, certainly school choice in particular is, um, you know, there are many many parents who feel that it is the most important decision, you know, that they can make. Right. And if there are two people, as there are two people in each of your cases who are making that decision, and if, you know, I think, Mindy, you raised this uh, early, right, so many parents, um, I think this is part of the, the power of the ideology, right, so many parents think that this is the way I express, right, my love mm -hmm. and my, this is the way I show it most manifestly. Right, by sending them to like the most expensive school, the school with the highest test score, that they can get that kind of thing. The point is that it feels like a high stakes decision, right, for most parents. So, and it's not, and to make an unusual decision as you've both done, I'm just wondering, you know, were your partners just on the same page? If you don't mind sharing, maybe you do. Was there tension around that? I mean, that's just a very real thing most of us have to deal with if we wanna do this kind of, make this kind of decision. I think that's such a great question. I think that is such a good question because no, you're not always on the same page. I mean, I think it's uh, it's like any decision. You're you're making a life correction, right? I call it a correction, a change. Uh, you're looking at things in a different light, and you have to decide like this is really important to me, and this is why, and this is my thought around that, and how you, how do you feel? I mean, so in my world, my husband also really liked Montessori. He thought Montessori is just right, really great pedagogy for us. It works for us. It makes sense to us. So, so we're going to leave that and just go to some, you know, neighborhood school, you know, we're going to go to some school where our child is going to have to sit in a desk for maybe longer periods of time than he would in this other kind of environment, right? Like, 
Um, and so it wasn't, it was just kind of a very long conversation. That in conversation uh, first took place, it has to take place in, you know, a big picture uh, way, kind of talking about maybe the, the, the way it affects the community. And then you kind of drill it down to, you know, what do we want more for a child? But I think the really important thing is for that you and that, you know, your partner to walk through a, that school or a handful of schools. And so you both can kind of and visualize the child you both love so much in that space. And, um, and then, you know, let go of that narrative and just, and just kind of just let it happen. Let it happen. I don't know. I mean, I, it is, yeah, there's a little bit of blind trust there when you are um, walking away from what everyone tells you is the right thing and you are questioning what everyone else says is right. So. Yeah, no, I, so the, the long answer and short answer is like, no, it's, it's a, a thing that both people have to kind of reach. And I have some friends that are going through that exactly right the second. Uh, they, they're having that kind of conversation where they um, don't really know uh, what to do and the husband and wife are kind of on two different places, um, but you know. I just talked with a, I just talked with a family or a dad who, uh, said that he divorced his first wife over this. I'm sure there must have been other issues, but he blamed th that he wanted to go to an integrating school and wife didn't. And, you know, so there are really real issues because there's not really an easy middle ground in these spaces. And um, I was, I don't know, sort of lucky in that my partner didn't care. He just really wanted me to stop talking about school. <laughs> so I started this thing. But, um, <laughs> um, I don't remember the other part of your question, so I'm going to be quiet. It was a, it was really about uh, engaging the non-choir. Um, so besides your you know your challenge to walk the the hallways of the neighborhood school, how else do you do it? And I think people are looking for advice for how how can they just have this conversation fruitfully with their friends who are not so inclined. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really hard hard conversation in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the way we're looking at it as integrated school is it's, um, you know, we have so many people who are part of the, you know, technically part of the choir, right, who are, who care about race and justice and social justice and equity and all of these things who are still not making this choice. So we need to kind of tip in the people who are in the choir. Like the choir's bad right now. A bad choir so we need to like work on the choir and then when we have when we have a solid beautifully harmonic choir then we can actually really have different conversations in a much you know a much more broad and loud way and in changing just disrupting the narratives that keep people from stepping into these integrating spaces uh, I saw Bryce and written how do you how do you talk about this without sounding sanctimonious and um, I love that question and Mindy does too as part of the quote tiny sanctimonious army I mean I think you know it's hard and it's difficult and it's a lot about asking questions like what do you mean that no one sends their kid to that school because there's kids in that school right like just asking just simple questions that try to get people to think about the assumptions that they made in that question and I think sometimes you have to kind of be okay a little bit with sounding a little bit sanctimonious a little bit right like it's about knowing when and where and how and what you're standing up for in what space yeah so we're just about done I, I, I love that question too and I think it's just again the ideology around this right just it's very radical in our culture to think of each kid as being value, you know, valuable, equally valuable, like that your kid is not more valuable than another kid to society, right? So um, I think it's really hard. We've been really taught that that's not true. And um, so, so it ends up feeling like, oh, you're, do you're doing this because it's morally correct. And you're not, you know, you're just, it's a no bless the leaves thing and you're not getting so much at, you know? Whereas I think, I think where you're coming from, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to explain in our work as well, because so often people think that you're asking, people of privilege think you're asking them to, you know, just be, you know, be nice or share a little bit. To make the sacrifice for the greater good. Right, right? when it's actually, there's this, this kind of 
yeah, when actually it's better for all of us, right? Like to have authentic relationships, it sort of affects us all yeah. if we don't break down these barriers. So it's very, it's hard to talk about, obviously, in the way that I'm talking about it makes that clear. Um, <laughs> you have to have all the things in the air at the same time, right? Like it is the right thing to do if we actually feel like we're a part of a democracy and a society, right? But too far down that road is quickly turns into saviorism, right? And yet if you're doing it because I want my kid to, you know, benefit on the backs of black and brown kids, like that's also super problematic, right? But it is good for my kid to be in these spaces. And it is good for the world to think about, you know, for democracy, whatever, to think about what it means to actually be together and grow up together. But it's none of those that much, but it's all of those a little bit. And it's hard to juggle that. We're not good at it. We're not, good. not good at it. And I would, I would take it a step further and I would say, yes, privileged people, give a couple things up. Do it. It's okay. Like, just give, give it away a little bit. Because um, that's, you know, that's equity. That's equity, right? Um, because, uh, you know, I got to this point in life, not just on my own hard work and pulling up my bootstraps. I need to be honest about that. There is a, a system in place that is, is meant for me to succeed. There's a system in place that's already meant for my children to succeed. I'm not, and by sending my child to a school that's not the giving us absolutely the most privileges, you know, uh, giving us all of those additional resources doesn't mean I love my child less. It doesn't mean that my child's a guinea pig. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that I'm giving my child a different experience and that experience is good because I, if my child's a guinea pig, then we have to say all of the children in that school are guinea pigs. And then why should my, why should they be guinea pigs? They shouldn't. And I think your point, Melissa, is really great. Like, of course my child's special to me. I birthed my children. I love them more than anything. But my child isn't more important. My child doesn't deserve more money. My child doesn't deserve more resources, right? They, I mean, they, do, they don't. When we're talking about, especially when we're talking about public school education, those are public dollars, right? So I think that, yeah, I mean, for me, it always comes back to trying to make a really good person, um, you know, a, as best I can, a person who's kind of got a, bet, a better eye on the world around them and is, you know, has more of those experiences and can kind of internalize more of that. And so the only way I know how to do that is to start when they're very little, and raise them that way. And that hope that society doesn't fill in the gaps, but that I can help work on those gaps as we move forward. And it's messy and it's hard and I don't know how to do it. And I'm figuring it out and places like integrated schools is how I can plug in and say, oh my gosh, this just happened or that happened or I don't know what to do here. Or my child is that got a really great question, but how do I even address that? Like these are really awesome, beautiful, authentic, Things, and these are things that I want my child to come and start talking about at six and at eight and 10 and 12 um, because eventually I won't be the one answering them. And so I want to prepare kind of that framework for my child to kind of move forward. Mindy, thank you. Amen to that. And I want yeah. to end on this uh, note on. from Kristen who says, finding integrated schools was life changing for me. My kids are 15 and 18 and have attended minority white schools. We've had great experiences, but felt very alone until we found integrated schools. Mm -hmm. um, is there any uh, last, being the organization. Any last yeah. thought for folks? So um, thanks to Jessica for um, you know, alerting people to integrated schools community on mm -hmm. Facebook. Uh, you also have a website. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other sort of one or two resources for folks who want to know about, you know, sort of integrated school movement or other major organizations they should know about? stuff, yeah. I'll just plug two seconds. Um, we're having a book club in the beginning of May and it's online. So I, I, we keep it small, like 10 and under and just actually really discuss um, discuss something in depth. And this book is the, that we're reading is called Despite the Best Intentions. And it's how when white families show up, there's, um, they inadvertently, well-intentioned, um, support inequity on campus. So it's a really great book and I would love for you all to join us.
Oh my God, that sounds great. Thank you this, so much, you guys, um, it's been great. This yeah. has been wonderful. Yeah. I have to give a plug. I put the link into the chat for our uh, fundraiser for actually this series, uh, both to extend it and deepen it. Mm -hmm. uh, we want, you know, there are all sorts of reasons. If you go to the donation page, we have a little bit of description of what we want to do. But if you can and are inclined to, please uh, do support us. Today is the last day. Courtney and Mindy, really excellent conversation. Yeah. Really appreciate the work you're doing yeah. and coming here to share it with us. Yeah, and so many more conversations oh, to be Oh, yes. Had. Yeah, like, call me, Mindy. Call me. <laughs> um, okay, so across time zones, we're going to put this up on um, the web by tomorrow, the, the video, and we'll send any other resources, including, you know, links to... Uh, Mindy's org in Houston and to integratedschools.org, although I just gave that to you. And their Facebook is always a good place, right, to have the conversation. And this book group, gosh, I want to join that book group. Um, so thank you guys. We will, um, yeah, we'll send you resources. So Mindy, Courtney, if you have any more to give us, we'll, we'll send to, to this list. Thanks, thanks folks. you guys. Thanks, thank everyone. Race, race. It's great. Uh, we appreciate Take you guys. Care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.